Hey everybody, Dr. Retzek here. This is our intro to section 14.4 in Calc 4. Now, section 14.4 has a familiar title. Section 14.4 is all about what's called chain rule. Now, you guys are masters of chain rule for functions of one variable. So if this were the example, let f of x equal sine of x cubed, then you guys know that to compute the derivative, you think of this as a composition of functions. There's this outer function, the sine function, and then there's this inner function, x cubed. And chain rule says, oh, if you want to know the derivative of this composition of functions, you simply differentiate the outside function first, leave the inside alone, and then remember to multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now, you guys have memorized this and you're super good at it and you would never miss a chain rule problem. But we need to think back about why this is the way you should differentiate a composition of functions. So let's really think about this. Think about what the derivative is. It's telling you the rate of change. So f prime of x is telling us what's the rate of change with respect to x. In other words, if we make a small change in x, how can we expect the corresponding change in the function to behave? Thinking about it that way, it actually makes a little bit of sense that you should multiply. After all, a small change in x will produce a small change in x cubed. That small change in x cubed will then produce a small change in the sine of x cubed. So really what's happening is you're changing the input x by a little bit. That change is being routed through x cubed and is governed by x cubed's derivative. And then that produces a small change in x cubed which is then being routed through sine by way of sine's derivative. And the overall rate of change is the product. Now it makes sense that the overall rate of change is the product if you say this in more familiar terms. If Joe is twice as fast as Bob, and Sally is three times as fast as Joe, then what's Sally's rate of change with respect to Bob? Six times as fast. You multiply the individual rates of change to get the overall rate of change. So we're good in one variable. It makes sense. You got the inside function, the outside function. We need to ramp up this understanding into Calc 4. Today's video is really short and just has the overall scheme for how we're going to do this. We'll talk some more on Friday about consequences of chain rule and um, maybe some deeper ideas about why chain rule is the way it is. For now though, we just want to get the principles down. So think about this example. Let's make it look exactly like the first example, except that it looks more like a Calc 4 setting. Okay, here we go. Let f of x, y equal sine of x cubed y.
okay, well, that's a perfectly reasonable function of two variables, f of x, y. You can see the function f depends on both x and y. And if you wish to differentiate that function with respect to x, say, then you would be interested in partial derivative of f with respect to x. And you realize, oh, oh yeah, cool, cool. So chain rule is exactly the same. I see, because we're just treating y as a constant anyway. Yeah, great. Okay, so derivative of the outside. Sweet, leave the inside alone. And then don't forget to tack on derivative of the inside with respect to x. So 3x squared y. Hey, you're right, Retzik. It is exactly the same. Okay, that example was super simple. Let's look at another one where we might begin to question how strong the analogy really is with Calc 1. Okay, here's another example. Let f of x, y be sine of x cubed y, where x itself depends on s and t by s e to the t and y itself depends on s and t by s plus t squared. Okay, this example is a little different. Initially, it looks as though f is a function of x and y. After all, the formula is right there, f of x, y equals sine of x cubed y. But then we come to find out that the variables x and y themselves depend on other variables s and t. So in the end, f actually really depends on s and t. Because if you change s and t, that will result in a change in x and y, which will result in a change in f. So in the end, f really depends on s and t. And, and actually, you could substitute in directly for x and y to see the formula for f as a function of s and t. So really, f depends on s and t in the sense that f of s t, well, f was sine of x cubed y, but x was s e to the t, so s cubed e to the 3t, that's x cubed times y, s plus t squared. So there's a formula for f in terms of the letters s and t, which means you might be interested in the partial derivative of f with respect to either of those. So df ds and df dt might be of interest. And surely we could go and find those now. If you want df ds, just treat t as a constant and do the same problem that we effectively did back here. There's a way to diagram these chain rule problems that illustrates how the rule works. And that's all we want to accomplish today. These are called branch diagrams. They are a tool to help us do chain rule problems. So let's consider that previous example. f depended on x and y. And x and y themselves depended on s 
and T. So you see in the end, F depends on S and T. Now let's say you wanted information about F's rate of change with respect to S. The way to think about that is to look at your branch diagram and think about the different pathways that a change in S could propagate all the way up to a change in F. So if you change S a little bit, that will result in a small change in X, which will in turn result in a small change in F. But that's not the only way that a small change in S could trickle up to F. A small change in S could also affect Y, which would in turn affect F. So you see that there's two branches through which a change in S will affect F. Thus, to keep track of F's rate of change with respect to S, we follow each branch. So for the orange branch, well, this is F's rate of change with respect to X times X's rate of change with respect to S. Plus, we also have to follow the green branch. So this is F's rate of change with respect to Y times Y's rate of change with respect to S. The color coding goes like this. That product is telling you about the orange branch, this product is telling you about the green branch. You can also see, it's funny, it almost looks like, if you're trying to memorize this, it almost looks like, you know, the dy's cancel and the dx is they cancel. Now that's not a legitimate algebraic cancel right there. That makes no sense, because then it looks like you have on the other side two copies of dfds. So we're not literally canceling, but it is some sort of a visual mnemonic to help us think about how chain rule should go. So this right here, this equal sign, that's chain rule. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be quiet for one minute. And you are going to look at that branch diagram and write down the correct chain rule for DF, DT. Okay, I'll be quiet right now. All right, hopefully what you did was you used your eyes first and you went and looked to see the different ways that T could propagate to affect F. So there's this purple branch right here. And there's also this blue branch right here. Those are the two ways that a change in T could result in a change in F. And the rate of change by chain rule is therefore df dx times dx dt plus df dy times dy dt. And that's how these branch diagrams work to help you. Let's do one more example and then you guys will be prepared to go and try some chain rule problems. Okay, here we go. One last example.
Okay, this time, let's say that W depends on just X, which depends on S and T, which each depend on U and V. So in the end, W depends on two variables, U and V. Those are sort of like the innermost variables. A change in U and V makes a new S and T, which make a new X, which makes a new W. So if this was your branch diagram, then you might be interested in, say, DW, DV. If you're interested in DW, DV, you use your eyes first, look at the branch diagram, and find all the ways that V could propagate up to W. So there's this branch. That's one way. And there's this branch. Those are the two ways that V could affect W. So the chain rule in this example would say, DW DV is regular DW DX, because that's not a partial derivative, in this section, W depends only on X. There is no other variable at that layer of the diagram. Times DX DS times DS DV. And all of that goes with the orange path. But that's not the only path plus, well, there's the green path. So regular dw dx times dx dt times dt dv. And all that corresponds to the green path. So depending on the branch diagram, however many layers deep it is, you just keep your wits and find all the pathways from the variable you are interested in, V in this example, all the way back to the top variable, W in this example. However many pathways there are, that's how many chunks are going to be involved in your chain rule. Okay, go draw some branch diagrams and make sure you got the mechanics of chain rule dialed in. And then we'll talk a little bit more on Thursday and Friday about chain rule. Okay, see you next time.